What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the Blazers Uprise post-game show here on a... What is it? What is today? I'm just so absolutely uh, baffled as to what I just watched from Scoot Henderson. Phenomenal game from him. Six for seven from three. A poster dunk. You'd love to see it. I also got weird... Weird feedback in my ear. I'm going to have to fix that real quick. Eric should be on in a bit. I'm not sure when. Um, all right, there we go. Kind of messed with my intro. I had feedback. Never had that happen before. Anyway, Blazers lose. Blazers are in a two-way tie for fourth best lottery odds with the San Antonio Spurs now. And Scoot Henderson goes off in the loss. And... Last I checked, the Warriors were down. Let me check that final score. This might have been a pretty perfect day for the Blazers. As the Warriors, yes, they indeed lost to the Pelicans. The Spurs beat the Nuggets. They got Detroit on the final day of the regular season. And your Portland Trail Blazers with this loss move into a, a two-way tie for fourth best odds. We'll take a look at what that looks like in terms of the percentages in our Tankathon segment here a little bit later. But man, what a game from Scoot. He struggled from two. I'm going to talk about that. But you love the way he's shooting the ball. You got to love it, man. Phenomenal stuff from Scoot from behind the arc today, including a logo prayer and multiple step backs, a couple of which reminded me a little bit of Damian Lillard. And after worrying so much about his shot earlier in the season, this dude is, is shooting the cover off the ball in some games as of late. Distributing the ball as well. Unfortunately, he didn't get to finish this game. I would have loved for him to have pushed for a 40-piece. But, man, I love the flashes. I love the playmaking. I think the stuff from 2 will get there, and I will have a conversation about all of that. But, man, this was a fun game. And the last game in Moda Center this season was a pretty fun one, I think, for fans that attended. Uh, the Rockets did have a double-digit lead for pretty much the entire second half, but with Scoot playing like he did, the fans got a show. The fans had something to cheer for. The fans had something to get out of their seats for. And now the Blazers have one game left on the season. I can't believe it. They play Sunday against the Sacramento Kings. Maybe the Blazers can finally polish their floor now, too, now that they don't have to play on it anymore. Um, but anyway, chat, hopefully you guys are having a good day. Let me know what your thoughts are on this game down in the live chat. Eric flew back from Vegas. His flight got delayed. Uh, so he, I don't know. I don't plan on streaming too long tonight. If he's here within an hour, then, uh, we'll be able to bring him on. If not, might just have to wait for Sunday. But before we get into this post game stream, I want to give a couple shout outs to both our sponsors. This stream is sponsored by Manta Sleep Mask. If you uh, use the link in the description box below, you can head over to mantasleep.com and use promo code UPRISE for 10% off your order. And it's also presented by our friends over at BetUS. BetUS, America's favorite sportsbook and casino. Live betting and racebook. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. BetUS, where the game begins. And if you want free play over at BetUS, I have five $25 giveaways $25 in terms of free play that you can get if you have a BetUS account. I'm giving that to the first five people that message me on Discord or on Twitter. So just reach out to me if you have a BetUS account or if you make one. And if you want $25 of free play with the NBA playoffs right around the corner, just reach out to me. I'll hook you up. I'll set you up. I'll get you that deal that BetUS is offering you guys. We'll also take a look at some playoff lines a little bit later and whatever BetUS has to offer us in terms of NBA props because, man, there's only two get two days left of the season. There's no games tomorrow, so it's basically just one day. I don't know if they did this in previous years, but uh, the, play, uh, the NBA had 15 games today. Every team was in action today. No games tomorrow, and then every team's in action on Sunday, right? You're obviously not going to have a team play three games three days in a row. 
Um, so jam pack day today, jam pack day on Sunday, and there's some playoff races that are very, very intriguing. So we will take a look at that at some point in the stream, seeing how the standings shake out. There's a three way tie for first in the West. Um, but of course we got to recap this game. We got to talk about the lottery picture as well. There's a lot to get to. I'll also try and answer your questions, um, regarding anything you guys have questions about when it's a solo stream. I like to... Uh, I like to get your questions. I like to let you guys participate even more in the conversation when it's just me up here. But man, today was fun. Today was a lot of fun. Even my Mariners won, I think. They were up 4-0 last I checked. Oh, they almost they almost choked, but they won 4-2. Even my Mariners won. There's just a lot of good things going on today. Shout out to JP Savvy. Speaking of a good thing, JP Savvy is a channel member. That's a good thing. If you want to become a channel member, click the join button. But JP, Ma JP Savvy, member for four months, says, Sorry for being MIA so much lately. Go Blazer Tank Emoji. <laughs> Good to see you, Savvy. I understand fans that are MIA and not paying much attention to this team as of late. Hopefully they paid attention tonight, though, because tonight, I think, was the funnest game to watch in quite a while with some of the things that Scoot Henderson did. And right now, we're just looking for hope, man. Looking for hope and... Scoot Henderson, I think, is giving it to us a little bit right now. He's given me even more hope. I've been patient with Scoot all season long. I think people overreacted to some struggles early. It was tough, though, when he comes into the league and shoots two for 24 from three to start his career. But now his three-point percentage is above 32%. Like, if he has a good shooting game from three... His final game against the Kings, he's going to shoot 33% from three on the season. I think we all would have taken that going into the season, knowing that he needed to work on his three-point shot a little bit. Um, on the season, he is now, what, 87 for, I think, 268. I'll look up his, his shooting stats. Um, let's see. Entering this game, Scoot Henderson was 81 for 261. So he's now 87 for 268. That is 32.5% from behind the arc. And if you take out that 2 for 24 shooting stretch where he wasn't wearing the goggles, wasn't wearing contacts, which he started wearing after that 2 for 24 start, on the season, he's shooting 85 for, what is that, 244 from 3. Which is basically 35%. It's 34.8. So... That's kind of a goal for him next year, 35% from three. I'm just impressed with some of the threes he's hitting. You know, it's not just like he's making wide open three-pointers uh, the past couple of weeks. He's hitting step backs. He's hitting threes off the dribble. And last post-game show last night, I talked about how he needs to improve his footwork to be able to like cleanly pull up from three. But that step back is looking really, really good. And the rhythm on it is looking really, really good. And also, I had a tweet about this a few days ago. The rhythm on his shot just looks much, much better. His shot looks much more fluid. He had a little bit of an uh, elbow hitch on a shooting elbow at the start of the season. He seems to have ironed that out a bit. His shot actually looks pretty dang good right now. And there's times where he gets happy feet trying to uh, set his feet pulling up from three where his shot doesn't look as smooth but that's all footwork related I think the rhythm the flow the shooting elbow all that has improved I gotta give props to whoever in this coaching staff is working with him on his jump shot because they've made serious progress on it I think this season and I'm very curious to see how well Scoot shoots next year but I think one of the biggest keys for Scoot to become an all-star caliber player, he has to be a, a volume three-point shooter, right? I, I He's just not John ja Morant athletically, but even John ja Morant can hit some step backs, can hit some shots. You know what I mean? He, he can hit some threes off the dribble, um, but he's just a freakish, freakish athlete. Scoot is really athletic, but... You know, guys like that are are just unmatched in a way. Guys like Jaw, um, guys like Prime Derrick Rose, which didn't last long because he was almost too athletic for his own good. Of course, the knees went with him. Um, I think for Scoot, the easiest way for him to become a star caliber player and fulfill his upside is by being able to hit threes, especially off the dribble, especially step backs, especially off pick and rolls. Because then he's going to be able to hesitate, get guys to bite on that hesitation. Then he's going to be able to get downhill and get into the paint. And 
He's struggling with his percentage from two this year, don't get me wrong, but it's not something that really has me worried, and I'll get into that in a little bit. It's it's just crazy right now how he's giving us hope with his three-point shot, given how dire things looked at the start of the season with his three-point shot, where he was getting wide-open catch-and-shoot shots, wasn't hitting rim on some of them. Like, just bad, bad misses. So I gotta give props to whoever's been working with him, and I also gotta give props to Scoot for improving his three-point shot the way he has. There's other guys on this roster that I wish in multiple years they would improve as much from three as it seems like Scoot has this season, right? So, man, love to see him knocking down threes. That near half-court heave was, I guess you could say, lucky, but, I mean, he shot it and he made it, you know what I mean? Like... It was a hell of a shot, a fun play. Uh, phenomenal. Wish he didn't shoot that 7-3. I wish I could be talking about him going 100% from three today. Phenomenal shooting night from him, though. Six for seven from three. Shout out to Rip City Retro, $5 donation. Says, really weak, but wanted to come on and say on November 15th, 2022, we were first in the West. Now on April 12th, 2024, we are last. We did it. My love to everybody. Rich, I hope you're um, hanging in there, man. I hope you're uh, doing all right. Appreciate your donation and you showing up to the stream, man. Uh, first to last. First to last in uh, less than two years. Impressive stuff, man. Impressive stuff. Yeah, the Blazers move into last place in the Tankathon standings in the western conference not tankathon uh <laughs> i'm so used to to thinking about it in terms of tankathon the blazers are now tied for last in the west with the san antonio spurs and the good news is the blazers final game is against the kings which the kings have something to play for um they they don't want to be the ninth seed they're currently playing right now and they're up four against the suns with a little over a minute left so if the Kings win that game, they have 46 wins, Lakers have 46 wins, the Suns have 47 wins, and the Warriors are in 10th with 45 wins. Uh, so the Kings have something to play for. Meanwhile, the Spurs play the Pistons on Sunday. Their final game of the regular season is against the Detroit Pistons. Obviously, the Pistons uh, are bad. Although, I think... Did the Pistons win today? They might have won today. Um... Yeah, the Pistons beat the Mavericks by 18 in Dallas today, but the Mavs didn't have Kyrie Irving, didn't have Luka Doncic, didn't have Derek Lively. Um, the Pistons got 24 from Marcus Sasser and 18 from Chemezi Metu and 13 off the bench from Evan Fournier. And former Blazer Jared Roden was 5 for 5, if you guys remember him. 11 points for him. So Pistons did win today. They could beat the Spurs. But I think the Spurs are going to win that game. That game is going to be in... Let me check here. That game is in San Antonio. And San Antonio's crowd was raucous today, man. If you guys didn't see that game, the Spurs were down 23 points in the second half. And Victor Wenbanyama had 17 points in three minutes to help lead a comeback charge... The Spurs were down one, about a five to six second differential shot and game clock with the Nuggets having the ball. So the Nuggets up one, have the ball. They miss a shot with five seconds left. The Spurs push the ball up the court, hit an outlet up the court to Devontae Graham, who has like a Euro step floater with 0.9 seconds remaining to take the Spurs from being down one to being up one. It was electric. The crowd was was hype man and I was hyped because that was a huge play huge floater to win the game a game winning floater from Devontae Graham with less than a second left gives San Antonio the win in Denver I was just counting on San Antonio hopefully being the Pistons I didn't think they'd take care of the Nuggets and it looked dire at one point during that game it looked like it was an afterthought Nuggets up 23 in the second half defending champs and the Nuggets are playing for home court advantage throughout the west so they're playing for something that game looked over but the Spurs come back, get the win, and that's why the Blazers are tied for fourth in the lottery standings. Um, and we will take a look at that in a second. Christopher in chat says, Scoot can shoot better than Tori. Let's go. That's always a great thing if you can shoot better than me. 
Um, and I love that Scoot is shooting the way he is. Taylor Packer says it's funny because I was watching the Hornets because that was the one I thought would work out in our favor, but they got blown out in the Spurs one. Yeah, the Hornets were playing the Celtics. The Celtics had multiple players out, including Tatum, including Jalen Brown. But since Christopher brought up me playing basketball, that's a reference towards West Lynn's very own Peyton Pritchard went off, went off today for the Celtics. 31 points. I don't know if that's career high for Peyton Pritchard. But 31 points, 11 assists for the Celtics. Who also starred Luke Cornett. He had 16 points. Sam Hauser, who had 16 points. And Jaden Springer, who had 11. And then they had Nemius Keita in 18 minutes have 16 off the bench. Like, they played Drew Peterson. Drew Peterson played 12 minutes in this game for the Celtics. A lot of you were probably saying, who? Exactly. Exactly. The Celtics win this game by 33 over the Hornets. Unfortunate. Could have been a three-way tie. That would have been great. But Peyton Pritchard goes off. So the Blazers are in a four... Are in a tie for fourth place with the Spurs. Let's just pull up Tankathon now. Let's just take a look at this picture. And show you guys how the odds work themselves out in a tie like this we'll also simulate it and see if we're lucky without eric every soundboard item is going off in my ear right now i don't know if y'all can hear it but it's uh yeah it's just a running a running joke at this point every time i pull up tankathon you're gonna hear like four different soundboard items i don't know why they all play it doesn't really make sense to me <laughs> so this is meanwhile before we get into this the suns who i just said were down four are now up one nurkic was at the line he's hitting clutch free throws well he missed the first one but hit the second one so the suns go up one I'm willing to commentate the end of this game if you guys really want. And then we'll simulate this thing. But as you guys can see with the odds, the Kings called timeout, so this is in a commercial break. As you can see with the odds with the Blazers and the Spurs being tied, they get evened out. Normally, fourth place has a 48% chance at top four, and fifth place has a 42% chance at top four. With it being a tie, it gets averaged out. So that's why 48 and 42 averages out to 45. And normally it's 10.5% chance at number one in fifth and a 12.5% chance at number one in fourth. That gets averaged out to 11.5%. So that's how everything works with ties in the lottery. Meanwhile, you got the Kings... They're at home. They're going to inbound the ball down one with 8.7 seconds remaining. They're probably going to want to get a shot off quick enough to have a putback chance. They do have a timeout left. They get the ball into De'Aaron Fox. He's going to attack Bradley Beal, and the Suns had a foul to give. It looked like Fox might have been shooting, but the Suns give a foul to give with 6.3 seconds remaining on the game clock. Kings didn't really want to run an inbounds play. They just gave it to Fox and he drove maybe some gamesmanship there knowing they had a foul to give and now they'll run something. Now that the Suns are in the bonus, you got Harrison Barnes to inbounds. He's going to get the ball to De'Aaron Fox. He's going to attack Beal again and he's going to get stripped and the Suns are going to win. The Suns win. De'Aaron Fox gets stripped and the Suns complete a very impressive comeback. The Suns were down four with a minute left and come back and beat the Sacramento Kings. And this keeps the Suns alive for the sixth seed. Both the Pelicans and the Suns won today. The Suns were a game back at the Pelicans. Um, and I believe the Suns own the tiebreaker with them. So... If the Suns can win their final game, the Pelicans lose, and the Suns will be the sixth seed. They won't have to deal with a play-in. And it looks like 
you're probably going to have Kings Warriors instead of Lakers Warriors in the 9 verse 10 play-in as the Kings are now a game back. The Lakers, the Lakers won today. The Kings lost. The Kings do own the three-way tiebreaker with the Lakers and Warriors. There is still a chance the Warriors could move up to eight, I believe, um, if the Kings lose and Lakers win because the Warriors do own the tiebreaker with the Lakers. Obviously, as Blazer fans, we don't want that, okay? We don't want that. Here's the good thing. We can control that because we play the Kings on Sunday. So, rooting for another Blazers loss because with a Blazers loss, that does lock the Warriors into the 9 versus 10 play-in game. And if the Lakers win, that puts that game in Sacramento as Sacramento won the three-way tie with the Lakers and Warriors, I assume they also own the head-to-head tiebreaker against the Warriors. Um, so that Blazer versus Kings game, very important game, not only for the Blazers' own pick, their own lottery odds, but also for trying to keep this Golden State pick that goes to Portland in the lottery. Of course, Golden State could play their way into the playoffs from the 10th seed, but it's going to be harder having to win two meaningful uh, do-or-die games on the road. So Sunday is going to be a lot of fun just to see how everything shakes out, see what playoff matchups shake out, given how tight certain seedings are. But Blazers, odds bumped up for both the top four and the number one overall pick due to this tie with San Antonio. And if San Antonio can win on Sunday and Portland can lose, they would have a 48% chance of the top four and a 12.5% chance at the number one pick, which is almost maximized odds after this rough of a season to be that close to having their odds all but maximized would be great now charlotte the blazers could still technically tie with for third best odds they play cleveland they play cleveland cleveland right now has clinched home court advantage they're fourth they are one game behind the bucks and the knicks who are tied for second So they're second and third. I don't know exactly how that tiebreaker plays out. Let me look it up. I'm hoping the Cavs don't have anything to play for on Sunday. It looks like the Cavs could get the second seed. They'd have to win, the Bucks and Knicks would have to lose, and then the Cavs would get that tiebreaker. So, do the Cavs want the second or the third seed, though? Probably because they probably don't want to play the Celtics in the second round. They would probably rather have the Bucks or the Knicks. So, I think the Cavs may be playing for something there on Sunday. But you never know with teams, final game of the year, right? We've seen the Blazers bench a bunch of guys when it was win and they get the three seed and play the Thunder and lose. They get the fourth seed and play the Jazz. I don't know if they really cared about who they played and they won with Anthony Simons going off his rookie year, if you guys remember that game. And of course, that set up the matchup where Dame ended Russell Westbrook's tenure in OKC. So things have a funny way of playing out. We're just going to have to standings watch on Sunday and hopefully Charlotte can win because that would bump the Blazers odds up to you know if this is a three-way tie then the Blazers odds would be about 48% chance at the top four but if San Antonio wins and Charlotte wins and Portland loses that's the best case scenario Portland would have approximately 50% chance of the top four that is the highest it could get but right now just hoping San Antonio takes care of Detroit I don't expect Charlotte to win I think Portland will lose given that the Kings are playing for something um and the Warriors it's in their best interest to lose to Sacramento anyway let's simulate this thing scroll up from the bottom like we normally do at 14 Golden State pick to Portland at 13 Sacramento At 12, Houston to OKC. At 11 is Chicago. At 10 is Atlanta. At 9 is Houston via Brooklyn. At 8 is Utah. At 7 is Memphis. So far, it's all chalk. At 6 is the Toronto Raptors. At 5, this could be the Spurs. 
This could be the Spurs. We'll see if the Blazers moved up. At five is the Washington Wizards. So the Blazers remain in the top four. I haven't really said that before. They remain in the top four. Not moved up, they remain. Kind of, because it's a tie. I don't know. At four is the San Antonio Spurs. At three is the Charlotte Hornets. At two is your Portland Trailblazers. And at one is the Detroit Pistons. Hey, we'll take that. I'm not even going to play the no sound for the soundboard. Second overall pick, I actually think Detroit could be one of the most likely teams to take Zachary Reese They need wing shooting. That's Zachary Reese So Portland's in there at two. Behind Detroit, legitimate chance of being able to draft Alex Sar there. Now, just to kill the good vibes, if Portland drafts like Donovan Klingon there with Sar on the board, I'm going to lose my mind. And apparently, according to Woj, Donovan Klingon is in the running for the number one pick, which I think is absurd. But I think there's a good chance Sar could be there, and I think that's who the Blazers would take, and I would be very happy if they did so. Man, that would be fun. Anyway, that is the Tankathon picture. Blazers move up to two. We'll take that. Last time it was a solo stream, I think the Blazers got first overall, so... Is ED to Portland anywhere on your draft board? You know what? I could share my draft board if you guys are are curious right now. I haven't updated the graphic, but I could share Fanspo, which is a phenomenal website. Phenomenal, phenomenal website. I have updated it slightly. Slightly. Let's share it. Let's let's just go back to the tankathon. No, I have to move it. Let's mute the bet US ad. Let's just go over here. Yeah, that's what we'll do. So this is my updated big board. Not going to be a lot of movement at the top here. Alex R. Buzelis, Holland, Dillingham, Cody Williams, Stefan Castle, Reed Shepard, Isaiah Collier. This is a pretty clear-cut top eight for me. And then Salon, Dalton Connect. Dalton Connect is where like the more NBA-ready players are. The older prospects begin slash the guys that I'm not high on their upside, um, but I think have a high floor, right? Klingon, I think he's high floor, low upside. I don't like drafting those types of players in the top 10. Um, top itch, I have major question marks about, and I'm not a believer in his upside. I ha I'm much lower on Zachary Risa than consensus. I don't think he's much more than a role player at the next level. Um, so that's kind of where this big board transitions. But if... If it's an M, if it's like the Spurs, I'm more okay with them taking like a top itch, like at seven, eight, right? You need somebody to get Wemby the ball. This big board is just on average. There are certain teams where if I'm drafting for them, I move this big board around depending on what they need and depending on if they're trying to win sooner rather than later. I'm starting to really like Tyler Kolek. Watched him a bit at Marquette, them being a good Big East team, but I've started watching more Tyler Kolek film. I just think he's going to be a solid point guard and has a chance to be a good starter in the league. He can pass the ball. He's very crafty, good feel, quick enough, can shoot well enough, I think. Quick trigger on his three. I think he can come in and play a role right away. At least he'll be like a good backup point guard, maybe a Tyus Jones type of type of backup point guard but I think he could develop into a solid starting point guard so I've bumped him up a little bit uh Bub Carrington I've liked his game I've bumped him up a bit just a 6-5 guard that I think has shooting potential three level scoring potential moves well with the ball in his hands and 
was an okay playmaker is intriguing to me. This is not Jordan Ivy Curry. This is Tyon Grant Foster. I just included a different hyphenated name because unfortunately they don't have Tyon Grant Foster on Fanspo. So this is Tyon Grant Foster here at 21. Um, bump Keyshawn George down a little bit. I just don't know if he's going to be quick enough or strong enough at the next level to really make his creation ability pop. And he was pretty unproductive for stretches there at Miami. Had some good moments, but was very inconsistent. Um, Tristan Newton, I'm kind of coming around to Eric's point of view on him. I think he's a borderline first round pick. Um, this is a guy that's intriguing to me. Dottie it. It'll be interesting to see what he measures. Could be a Blazers option with a second round pick if they want to stash. I don't know if he's looking to come over right away, but he's a guy that I like. I'm low on Johnny Furphy. I have Zach Eady at 34 right now. Adama Ball wouldn't be a bad sleeper to take with either one of the Blazers' second round picks. And then beyond that, I don't know. This is going to change. I kind of have my top 40 that I'm confident in. Top 41, I think Harrison Ingram uh, could end up being a good role player. I might bump him up a little bit. But it's kind of hard to differentiate between a guy like Harrison Ingram and a guy like Tristan Da Silva. So a lot of these prospects, I think, are very, very close through this range. Closer than normal. And it's made it hard to rank this big board. Grant Nelson, I have late second. Austin ha Haseman says, the fact that you're so much lower on than most on Risa Shea is so funny to me. Um, yeah, man, like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to listen to consensus when forming my opinions. I try to just come up with my own opinions on prospects and not rely on other other people's, and that's the result you get. I'm lower on guys like Toppich. I'm go lower on guys like Risa Shea. But I will say, and I said this last stream, Risa Shea has question marks that other people have brought up where they're lower on him like legitimate people that um you know i trust their opinion and they've raised some of the same question marks i have about him so i don't think he's a clear-cut top guy at all and i i'm not the only one that feels that way it's gonna be interesting to see how the draft shakes out with guys like Risa Shea, Klingon, top itch etc but that was my big board What's Risha Shea's wingspan? I'm not sure. The good news is every prospect's going to have to measure, and there's multiple prospects in this draft with measurement questions. Ron Holland is one of them. He's listed at six foot eight in a lot of places. Watched him in person. I sat like second row um, behind the, <laughs> the Ignite bench, and Ron Holland looked about an inch shorter than Mo Harkless, and Mo Harkless is six seven without shoes. I think Ron Holland is six foot six flat without shoes. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see what he measures at. There's multiple guys where their stock is going to swing depending on what their measurements are because some listed measurements are two inches taller than guys actually are without shoes. Some are more accurate. So it's really hard just to base players right now because you have to take their height uh, with a grain of salt, their listed height, and then obviously wingspan standing reach matters and we don't know that for most prospects in the draft so we'll talk a lot about that when the combine happens in mid-may right after the lottery uh we'll talk about measurements and all that good stuff i'll tweet about it you can follow me on twitter at tory jones yt t-o-r-e-y link in description if you want to head over there and follow me um yeah back to this blazer game talked a little bit about scoot his play his shooting, he did go 4 for 16 from uh, 2, and I'm taking his shooting inside the arc with a grain of salt because, my goodness, defenses are packing the paint right now. The Blazers just don't have enough shooting, and it's going to be interesting to see next year if he's surrounded by more shooters, what his assist numbers look like because there's multiple times where he drives, and it's like, man, if he just had shooters and could just make a simple kickout pass... The game seems like it would be easy for him right now. He just, he, he has to get a little bit better at making that kickout pass when it's there because there is times where he forces stuff in the lane or doesn't see that kickout pass. 
I think he'll make that read more consistently next year, and I think he'll have more faith in some of the guys playing next to him, like a Jeremy Grant, Anthony Simons, etc. And that's where I could see him taking a playmaking jump, where right now he's averaging... Um, going into this game, he was averaging 6.8 assists per 36 minutes, which is good for a rookie. Luka averaged 6.7, right? Luka had a passing jump his second season. A lot of guys that end up becoming elite passers have a noticeable leap in playmaking for others their second season. And I think that's just because, you know, they have a year... Um, of experience playing against NBA players at the NBA speed. And then also in the offseason, you know, they can watch film on some turnovers, some reads they didn't make, focus on that, continue to work on their skills, become more confident as a ball handler, um, and just learn how to set up certain passes that maybe they weren't. I think Scoot's going to take a jump in terms of his playmaking I expect him to average like nine assists per 36 next year I think it's going to be a real real strength and I think the most simple pass that he could make that maybe he's not making enough is that kick out pass because there's multiple times he drives and tries to force things against multiple defenders part of that is yeah maybe needs to kick it out a little bit more but part of it is he doesn't have much shooting around him he's playing minutes right now with Justin Manaya. Delano Banton was 2 for 10 from 3 today. Rupert, yes, he shot the ball well for a rookie, but, you know, he's not really all that respected. Aiton, hey, Aiton shot two threes today. It's a miracle. He missed them both, right? Chris Murray, defenses leave Chris Murray. Chris Murray's gotten to the point where defenses don't respect his jump shot at all. At all. And he was 1 for 7 today. Brutal stuff. He's had multiple games this year where he's had multiple, like, 3 or 4 or even 5 Wide open threes that he's missed. Jabari Walker starts. He did make a three. He has been shooting the ball decently the past uh, seven to ten days, but he's a 28% three-point shooter as well. So when you got guys on the floor like that next to Scoot, defenders are just going to pack the paint against him. And I think that's part of the problem with his poor shooting from two. I think sometimes he looks to drive and maybe could beat his initial defender, but he realizes the paint is packed, so he shoots a pull-up mid-range jumper, which is never going to be as efficient as finishing around the rim. And I think with better shooting around him and with an improvement in playmaking and making the right decision when he drives, that's where you'll actually see his finishing jump because he's not going to be forcing as much and the paint isn't going to be as packed in the first place. And then if the Blazers can ever get out and run consistently then you'll see him have have some impressive finishes. Just like he had tonight when he got that steal and threw down that poster dunk on, I think it was Jeff Green. Right? Get him in space to load up and put a poster on someone. He can. So I'm not too worried about him going four for 16 from two. There is some things that he's doing on some of his finishes that I think have hurt him. I think there's I think there's plays where he tries to jump off two when he should be going off of one. And he had a couple misses in this game where it just looked like he's just throwing the ball so hard against the backboard and not even hitting rim. It's just like, what is that? On those finishes, if you notice, he's kind of jumping off two feet, but like he's a little off balance and he's getting bumped. And he tries to, like, jump off two feet and hang. But it's just, like, weird body positions for him to try and jump off two feet. And with contact, like, it would have been a little easier for him to go off one. So he's not getting off the ground that far. So he's shooting the ball almost when he's landing. And he's just, like, trying to get rid of it. Right? There's there's just some things he has to learn. Some things he has to work on in terms of his finishing. In terms of what foot he jumps off of when. And how he goes up in certain situ situations. That would help him with his finishing. I think a lot of people attribute it to a lack of touch. But if you've ever tried to shoot layups on the way down when you've almost landed. It's impossible to have good touch. Some of the best players can do that. Like LeBron was always really good at that. But he's 6'8". It's even harder for a guy that's 6'3". Um, so he'll get better at that sort of stuff. I think he has good enough touch to be a good finisher in the league. I just think he has to learn some nuances with that. I'm not concerned. 
I would love for him to, in a game where he goes six for seven from three, also go 10 for 16 from two instead of three for 16. But then he would have had like 45 points. I mean, and that was with him. He played 34 minutes. It looked like he got banged up at the end of this game. They were working on his leg. If that didn't happen, you know, probably could have played 40 minutes. So, I'm not worried about that stuff. Chat, let me know what you think on his finishing, on his two-point shooting. Yes, it's not efficient, but I'm not worried. The three-point shot was the thing that was really worrying me at the start of the season. He looks like a good shooter right now. And he shot good from the free throw line, which you can kind of use to project guys. He's above 80% from the free throw line. I didn't expect that to be the case. 82% from the free throw line is pretty solid for a player that had question marks about his jump shot and about his touch coming into the league. Bouquet says he looked comfortable in the mid-range game. He just wasn't hitting it. Yeah, he's very comfortable shooting mid-range shots. I think there's times where he has to settle for them compared to being able to drive an attack. The Scoot Shea will look different. Um, or this Scoot Shea will look built different, says Bot. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing those two run in transition. We haven't really seen Scoot throw Shea lobs in transition. Went back and rewatched a lot of Shane Sharp film recently. And man, in space, like when he can attack and transition, he was really impressive this season. Um, and both those guys, I think, will play at a faster tempo next year and control the pace a little bit more next year. And I'm really curious to see uh, how good they are together next season. And then, of course, with Ant. I mean, Ant shooting just helps make things easier on Scoo. And he can take a little bit of the ball handling pressure off of him. Um defensive and you have questions about those three for sure but offensively I think those three could be really good together and really electric that's why I'd love to get Alex Sar and just try and uh pair him with a DeAndre Ayton or maybe you can get an even better rim protector than Ayton and just have two elite rim protectors and then maybe you can make that three guard pairing work and then you can bring in a guy like Tomani as a six man off the bench for defensive purposes because you got enough scoring you got three guards where if defensively you're struggling, you can maybe sub out one of the guards, put in Kamara and Kamara Sar plus a rim protecting center should be able to get the job done. That's intriguing to me. Samuel Slee says, I feel like Scoot would have more assists if Murray could hit a three. Absolutely. And that's the thing is can't just quantify Scoot's passing and playmaking off of assists, especially on a team like this. Seven assists for Scoot tonight. The past couple of games, he turned over the ball a lot while also dishing out a lot of assists. Today, only one turnover with his seven assists. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. And if Chris Murray can make a three, it might have been 10 assists. might have been a double-double with 30 points, 10 assists. Um, but that just goes to show you, like, he just doesn't have enough shooting around him right now. And I'm so excited just for him to have another... Um, well, not another. It's his first true offseason as an NBA player, right? He gets to work on his game all, all summer, all offseason. And I'm excited to see what he looks like coming back from that with more shooting around him, more spacing around him. I think he's going to be really impressive next year. I think people wrote this guy off way too early because he didn't come out of the gates looking like a generational prospect. You going to the Nike Summit tomorrow? No. No. I got to work on something important for business tomorrow, but I'll try and watch it at least. Other than Scoot, um, nobody really played well, to be honest. The next leading scorer was Delano Banton. He had 28 points, 10 rebounds, 3 assists. And you might be saying, that's pretty good. What do you mean he didn't play well? Banton was 9 for 26 from the field. 9 for 26. That's not too efficient. 2 for 10 from 3. What's worrying me a little bit is Banton's 3-point shooting has... Started to decline. Back to 
what he was as a shooter before he got to Portland. Today, he was 2 for 10 from 3. Against the Pelicans last game, before this, because he missed a game, his last game, he was 2 for 8. So in his last two games, 4 for 18 from 3, the game before, 3 for 9, the game before, 2 for 6, the game before, 1 for 4. It's not too good, and I don't know what he is as a three-point shooter. Is he a 35% guy if he gets a consistent role? Maybe. It's also possible he came into Portland and had a hot stretch shooting the three ball. That was just because of a small sample size. I still think Banton deserves a shot to be in the rotation next year to see if he can build on this and actually play a productive role and an intriguing role as a 6'9 ball handling playmaker at like the backup small forward that can handle some point guard duties. The problem is though, like with three guards, do the Blazers really need that type of player? They have enough ball handling. They have enough guys that can initiate that can um, do things at a guard spot. I think Banton makes more sense on a team like Dame had early in his career where he had Wes Matthews as the shooting guard and Nicholas Batum is the small forward and they never really had a backup point. So you needed a big ball handler off the bench. Banton just has to be a little bit more selfless as a player. I think there was multiple shots tonight that he forced. Um, Intriguing player, intriguing player, but he forces too many tough shots. Then again, he doesn't have many players to pass to, and that's where next year is going to be intriguing to see, you know, with Grant playing, Simons playing, next to Banton, next to Scoot. Are these guys passing a little bit more because they have a little bit more faith in their teammates? I think that's a possibility. And I think they could be more efficient for it. Going to be interesting to see what the starting lineup will be next season. I, I think at this point, you have some... I don't know. I, I really like Kamara as the starting small forward. Next to any two of the guards. The problem is if you have Scoot and, and Sharp... And you start Kamara at the three, you obviously got to bring one of those guys off the bench. Who are you bringing off the bench? A lot of people will say, oh, you just trade Ant. I don't think they're trading Ant. I don't think they're trading any one of those three guys. I... Do you really bring Scoot off the bench? Is that the best for him to take a leap next year? Because... The Blazers need Scoot Henderson to become the best player possible, obviously. You want him to take a leap next year. I think you got to start him. You're not going to bring Ant off the bench. He's your best guard going into next season. If any one of those three guards comes off the bench, it's probably Shaden. But Shaden has the physical talent to take a leap too. He could take a leap into fringe stardom next year. You probably don't want to bring him off the bench. There's going to be some interesting things going into next season in terms of who plays, who starts, how things work out. But, I mean, they didn't start Sharp to start this year after he looked like a breakout player at the end of last season. So maybe they handle Scoot the same way. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The easiest thing is to probably start all three of them together and bring Tumani off the bench. And then you do have Banton, who's like a backup point forward where you can bring him off the bench with Tamani. And your bench is big with Tamani at the three and Banton at a guard spot. And your starting lineup is small with Sharp at the three, Simons at the two, Scoot at the one. That probably is the simplest thing, barring some shocking trade. But, man, Tamani is the Blaze. Tamani has a good chance of being the Blazers' best two-way player next year. The stuff he does defensively is impressive. 
he was really starting to figure things out offensively late in the season, both from a finishing standpoint and he was getting more and more confident as a three-point shooter. I think you have a clear-cut top four in terms of your point guard, shooting guard, small forward rotation. And in no particular order, that is Simons, Scoot, Sharp, Kamara. And then you have a fifth guy that slots in. Maybe that's Banton. Maybe that's still Matisse Thibel. Maybe that's somebody the Blazers draft. Maybe that's Cody Williams. I don't know. I don't know. But... This offseason is going to be fascinating just to see how the Blazers handle not only their roster in terms of having a little bit of a logjam in terms of okay role players at certain positions, but then also them being projected to be in the luxury tax. And how exactly do they utilize their picks? Because the Blazers need a hit on them. This offseason is going to be so fascinating to see play out. Roaring Engines says trading Grant would help. And what? Kamara up to the four? I like Kamara more as the three. With another hopefully switchable defender at the four. I don't think Grant is really that. I don't like Grant on guards. But yeah, you got some fascinating things going on with this team. Other players... Aiton started off two for eight in this game. He broke his streak of 20 point, 10 rebound games. I believe he had seven going into this game and <laughs> he didn't get close. 23 minutes, his lower back tightened up. He had six points, two rebounds, one assist. Basically didn't do anything. Scoot had a really nice lob to him. It was like a finger roll that Scoot turned into a lob and Aiton reverse dunk. That was a beautiful play. Aiton's back tightens up, though. He's probably not going to play on Sunday. His season is probably done as a Blazer. What he does next year is going to be interesting. I could see him taking a back seat, kind of like he did at the start of the season, if you have Scoot breaking out, Sharp breaking out, Kamara doing more things offensively, Grant still on the roster. Simons, of course. At the end of the day, Aiton in this roster, I still don't know if he's efficient enough to just like force feed him the ball with all these other guys. Especially these young guys that you want to continue to give the ball to in order to build them up. In order to grow their game. Aiton is a... Aiton on this team next year is probably more so just a play finisher. Right? Where you run pick and roll... Maybe hit him for a pocket pass for a mid-range jumper or hit him on a lob. He's played really well when he's gotten a bunch of touches this season. The second half of the year. But should he be getting that many touches where you just give him the ball and get out of the way? I'm not sure. It's not like he gets the line. He shoots 57% from two. Like, that's... Solid, but when you're not getting to the line, it's not quite as good as it seems. I don't know. I could see Aiden coming back next year playing like how he's played lately, just because he has a bunch of guys that can get him the ball. But also, I could see him taking a little bit of a backseat offensively and looking more like he did at the start of the season. That's going to be something fascinating to see how it plays out next year. I have no idea how that's going to go. I think the Aiden scoop pick and roll is something that is getting better and better by the game. I still do wonder if you just had an athletic rim protecting big that didn't demand as many touches as Aiton, if that might be better on a cheaper cost. Because Scoot could still throw them lobs. And that's the thing to, to pay attention with some of these guys that played better once Ant went out, once Sharp went out, once Grant went out. They got more touches. It's a tanking team. We have to remember to take some things with a grain of salt. When a team tanks and you have a player like Banton who's been in the league for, this is his third year, 
break out out of nowhere? Can he do the same on less touches to build a rhythm next season? Will he be more of a complimentary piece instead of a guy shooting 26 shots in 38 minutes? It's just some questions, right? I'm not even making any statements here because I, I don't know. But it's something to watch for. It's something to watch for because we've seen it play out where guys go off for a tank team. I mean, Skylar Mays looked like a starting caliber point guard this time last year. And then the Blazers cut him for nothing this year, right? So just have to keep that in mind. It's a little different with a guy like Scoot because it's, I mean, he's the third overall pick for a reason. He has the talent, he has the upside, and he's starting to scratch the surface of that. Just like Star Sharp started to scratch the surface of that last year. Anyway, I'll continue to take questions. I don't know if Eric's going to show up. Is Eric still in the chat? Eric, are you showing up soon or nah? Let me know. But chat, I'll take questions. Eric Olsen says, I'm fine if Aiden shoots less volume next year. If he gets hot, feed him. If not, spread the wealth. Oh, Eric's setting up. Okay, Eric will be here in a couple of minutes. Eric, just let me know when you want me to call you. Who do you want to the Blazers draft with our first round picks? I want Sar with the first one. And then, like, the most realistic player to fall to, like, 13 to 14 that I have my top 10 that I'd want for this team is Salon. I don't have him number two like Eric, but... I still like his upside with where you could draft him. Sar Salon would be a lot of fun. The thing is, if you get Sar and Salon, it doesn't make sense to value Chris Murray at all. And you probably don't need to keep Jabari Walker either. Because you got Aiton, you got Robert Williams, you got Duop Reith at the center spot. You, you'd have Grant, Sar, and Salon at the four? <laughs> like... That's six guys right there. Maybe you don't keep Reith then because you got Aiton and Robert Williams and then Sar can move from the four to the backup five if Robert Williams isn't playing or gets hurt or whatever. I don't know. But see, that's where you have a log jam in the, at the big man spots though. But the Blazers shouldn't pass on a guy like Salon with the Warriors pick because they have Chris Murray or because they have Jabari Walker. That doesn't make any sense, you know? So, that is why this offseason is extremely interesting to me. Zach Eady. Uh, no thanks. No thanks. If he's there with, like, the 34th pick, sure, why not? But you got Aiton, you got Robert Williams, you got Duop Reith, who is decent this year as a rookie. Like, I don't really know why you need Zach Eady. Who will be cut from the roster next year? Moses, Manaya, Baji, who else? I, I, they're going to have to trade away salary in order to duck the tax. They're going to trade somebody away. Man, I like Baji. I don't know why he hasn't gotten playing time. Yeah, I don't get it either. They're playing Moses Brown ahead of him. I'm pretty confident Moses Brown will be gone. What do you think Sharp Ceiling is? Star? I don't know if it's... Maybe a borderline top 10 player is like his ultimate ceiling, most optimistic outcome. A more realistic ceiling is probably just like a basic all-star level. Bot says Caleb Love has been to Dame's camp multiple years. He has to overcome a lot of adversity this year, but one of my favorites, does he even get drafted now? Probably not because he's an older, smaller point guard prospect. Those guys don't normally pan out. Um, there are guys who do, but he's listed as 6'4". He's probably going to come in like 6'3". So he's a 6'3 guard who spent four years in college and shot 33% from three last year, 32% for his career he's not a good enough three-point shooter he's also not a good enough passer average 3.4 assists for his career in 33 minutes a game like 
he's one of those smaller scoring guards that'll light up the G League probably, and that's it. I don't see him being an NBA caliber prospect. Why is everyone so fascinated by Edie? Because they know his name and because he's 7'4 and was a really good college player. I don't know if it's a hot take, but Edie's game won't translate to the NBA. That's not a hot take at all. It won't translate the same way. The question is, like, how much of it will? Because his entire game is... He's not going to come in and score 37 points in a game and be fed the ball the way he was fed the ball in college and be able to score in the post the way he was in college. He's going to have to defend in space more. That's going to be a problem for him. And he's going to have to become more of a pick-and-roll finisher. There is legitimate questions about his translation. Anybody who thinks he translates well to the NBA level, I think that's more of a hot take. Anyway, when we come back, Eric will be here to discuss this game, to discuss his trip to Vegas, to discuss his vacation, to answer your guys' questions, to interact with you guys. But first, I'd like to say a thank you to Manta Sleep Mask for sponsoring this post-game stream. Struggling to sleep at night, or do you want to relax during the day? Manta Sleep Mask has you covered. Their super comfortable, durable, adjustable, one-size-fits-all sleep masks will get you a good night's rest. But it can also help you relax during the day as well. And that's because these sleep masks block out all light, and you can also get them with cooling cups or steam cups. So whether you're falling asleep at night and want to use the Manta Sound Mask to fall asleep to some white noise, or if you've come home after a long day of work and want to de-stress with the steam cups, Manta has you covered with whatever your needs might be. For me, my days are pretty hectic. Running a business is no easy feat. I love to lay down, put on the Manta Sound Mask, and listen to some guided meditation as it really helps me slow down during the day. I heard from a lot of you that bought a Manta sleep mask around Christmas time and the reviews have been nothing but positive. So if you want to hook yourself up with a Manta sleep mask, check out the link in the description box below and use the promo code UPRISE on checkout as it'll give you a 10% discount on your Manta purchase. It's also a great way to support the channel. So check out Manta sleep mask and get yourself a good night's sleep. Now back to the post game show. Alrighty, so, man, it's been a minute since I've actually had you, like, normally on a stream, right? Because Tuesday <laughs> post-game show uh, and Picks Against the Spread, you weren't here for. We had Steven on, and then you were in Vegas last night. Um, <laughs> now now you're back, man. How was it? Well, it was awesome. Kind of sad to be home, but, yeah. Yeah. How long ago did you get home, by the way? Uh, like three minutes ago dude went in the front door back from vegas immediately to the post game show you love to see it you love to see it so i assume you uh weren't able to watch the scoot master class i i was able to watch most of it actually on the plane well i didn't watch much on the plane but um i yeah i i mean i watched the whole second half here in town and uh yeah got got to watch a little bit six for seven from three <sighs> poster donk struggles from two i talked about them i don't know how much of that you heard yeah i heard it all yeah so give me your thoughts um yeah i mean obviously these uh last few games from scoot are very encouraging heading into next year uh i liked how you put it just him giving us hope uh you know, that he can still become the player that we all <laughs> want him to be. Um, and, uh, yeah, I definitely saw his dunk. Uh, that was, like you said, good to see him out in the open floor. I think uh, he'd be so much more comfortable if he got a few more transition opportunities. And I do agree that the defense is, the paint is really packed. Um, I mean, for the last month or so, Teams have been just sagging way off of him and uh, just daring him to shoot. And it's nice to see him take advantage of that. Whether it's, you know, a long-term thing, uh, it's going to have to be if he becomes a star. You have to get to the point where 
teams don't do that. And if they does get to that point where the game plans start to switch, where you have to come out or go over screens against Scoot, uh, then it's over, I think, because he's he's just. I, I think he would be awesome if that if he got to that point. Um, but that's going to be the main determination, I think, <clears throat> whether he's just a really solid NBA player or um, that distributes the ball well or a star, is if he can get the defenses to have that attachment to him, that high gravity. Um, like Anthony Simons has, uh, I saw off ball gravity today. Anthony Simons was like 15th or 16th in the NBA at off ball gravity, and he's top five or six in on ball gravity. If Spoo ever had that kind of attention on defense, um, I, I just think the game would be so easy for him because of the way he can uh, manipulate defenses and drive the ball. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, the three-point shot, my goal for him next year, 35% from three. Uh, the the two-point stuff, I'm not really worried about. I thought it would be further along, but there is multiple factors that I think go into why he's struggling um, from two. Part of that is a packed paint. Part of that is... You know, he's not really utilized off the ball. Like, I think you could run some backdoor lobs for him. I think you could get him cutting where he could actually attack gaps. Because I think when he's had gaps, he's attacked them pretty well. He's had a few moments this year where he's um, stampeding into a catch, and you know, off a swing pass and has a gap because the ball just got swung and the defense hasn't shifted back over to his side of the floor yet. And he hits that gap with speed and finishes strong. Um, it's tougher for him when defenses are set in front of him. And unfortunately, a lot of his two point attempts come from him, um, taking multiple dribbles, right. Him having to go get it himself. So I think part of it is maybe just where he gets his shots, where he gets his touches. Part of it is a packed paint. Part of it is they don't get out and run enough in transition when they get out in space and especially sharp Kamara and scoot. I think they're all impressive. Um, I think Kamara had some impressive moments as a ball handler this year, but especially as a lane filler as well. And then Sharp, man, going back and rewatching some of his shots, like he was really good handling in transition because he uh, he knew when to push the gas. But he he was impressive this year just watching back clips, man. Like changing pace in transition, knowing when to slow down and like set up some of his drives, and then using his body, using his athleticism, right, like. Scoot out in the open court with those guys more next year should get him some good shots. And that's just kind of the problem right now is he's not getting good two-point attempts. And some of that is some stuff that he's doing to set up his finishes. But I think there's multiple factors that go into that that should be better next year. And then with the summer of work, hopefully he can learn what finishes to go to when. I think there's certain scenarios where he jumps off of two feet where maybe he should go off of one. Um, so just improving in those nuances, I think will help. I expect him to shoot much better from two next year. Is it going to be good? I don't know, but, um, I expect it to be better. Yeah, I hope you're right. I do. I I'm more concerned about his touch than you are. I do feel like he just kind of, I don't know what the right word is, but the best way to describe it is I feel like a lot of his shots, he's just trying to like jam the ball into the hoop, um, with force. My and, question for you is how many of those is he shooting on the way down? Um, He shoots a lot on the way down, and he does that thing sometimes where he palms the ball. He's got those big hands, um, or he'll, like, cup it, like, you know, like a dunk contest dunk or something. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I just – I feel like if you had really good touch and spin – I think spin is the most important thing because you can shoot on the way down if you know how to spin it right off the backboard. Or you're, if, even if the paint is packed, if you use angles and, and different um, ways to get your shot off, different different angles and stuff like that. Um, yeah, Kyrie is obviously the, the ultimate example of that. I mean, he's probably, if not the one of the best of all time, <laughs> at using spin off the backboard at different angles and stuff like that. But um, 
I think if if you're trying to attack a defense and you're going hard at the basket, if you even if you jump off one or two feet, I don't, I don't think it really matters if you're always right when you shoot it have the the ability to get it off the backboard where it needs to be with soft touch. And uh, I think that's something I'm not sure. I, I hope Scoot has that in him, but so far I haven't seen much like just like really nice, uh, like spin off the, off the window or anything like that. He seems to just always throw it hard off the glass. It's, you know what it is, man. It's mostly his, his body. Like the it's, not in terms of like strength or anything. It's mostly his like body control. Right. To me. Because a lot of these finishes where guys are shooting them on the way down, there's like an element of hang that they have where they jump, hang in the air in like contort, rearrange, right? Maybe initiate well, Sharp contact. That. Sharp does that, yeah. Like LeBron does that. But even some other guys, it doesn't necessarily mean jumping high. It just means like mm. jumping under control. And I feel like I'm gonna wait because I, I just want your thoughts on this. Um, <laughs> I feel like a lot of these finishes, where it looks like he's just throwing the ball off the backboard, that he's shooting on the way down, he is covering too much ground laterally on. Yeah, like he's not he's not slowing down. Like a lot of these guys when they when they shoot these shots around the rim where they like slow down and hang and shoot it on the way down, like they slow down enough to be under control. Whereas Scoo is like jumping and tr trying to hang and shooting on the way down, but he's like landing 10 feet away from where he jumped. And it's yeah. impossible, right? Because your momentum is working against you when you're trying to shoot those shots with touch because you're shooting on the way down, so you have to throw it a little bit harder up against the glass. And when you have that much momentum going towards the baseline, it's almost impossible to have touch on that. And I don't think his touch is, like, great by any means, but I think it looks a lot worse because of the way he jumps into some of these layups and shoot, shoots some of them. And that's mostly just due to... He's not decelerating enough. We've seen him have some decent touch on finishes where he like slows down, decelerates, and shoots them on the way down, but is is slowed down and under control, right? He's had some a couple really impressive deceleration finishes this year where it was like, man, those shots look like he had the most touch on any layups he shot this year. And I think that's a reason for it is because he's decelerating enough. There was a layup in this game where he drove left and jumped off two and just did not slow down enough. And that's where if you're not going to slow down, you need to go off of one because it's really hard at the speed he jumps off of two sometimes to shoot layups with touch, even if you do put spin on it, in my opinion. Um, so, so that's, I think, a big reason for it. There is obviously multiple things he could get better at, just touching certain situations, putting spin on it, etc., right? So it's not to say that that's perfect by any means, but I think the the base the baseline for him is being more under control if he's going to try and hang and contort and shoot the ball on the way down. Or if he's not going to slow down and get under control, jump off one and try and dunk it and try and get fouled that way. He just does, he, he does, he jumps weird and goes up for layups weird in certain situations that I think contributes to his misses. Yeah, it's kind of like, I don't know, play more like, well, you mentioned Derrick Rose earlier in this. I don't know if you want to go that extreme, but uh, Dwayne Wade was also kind of, and Brandon Roy a little bit too, just always jumping into the defenders, creating contact. Uh, you get worried every time they hit the floor multiple times a game. You probably don't want that extreme. But you do want, you mentioned this as well, he's shooting 80, over 80% for the free throw line. Um, at times this year, he has done a good job of getting to the line. Uh, so maybe just playing more into that contact instead of, uh, and not, because he's gotten some offensive fouls where he just clearly just lowers yeah. his shoulder or pushes off or whatever. So you don't want to do that. But yeah, just go up in traffic into the guy in the air and make the refs, See, uh, call that foul um, but don't get rid of the pushing off or using your off arm but yeah just go into the body of of the defender um, 
I think yeah, he'll so, learn all that stuff, which is why I'm not worried. Right. And um, and when you brought up the contact, like just quick side note, a lot of those guys rely on that midair contact to slow them down, to decelerate, right? right like they'll right. jump into the guy and then that contact like stops a midair. Sharp is a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think because um, a lot of the times he has decelerated or stopped on a dime and the defense like flies by him. I don't know if he's necessarily like shooting the ball differently. It's just like a, a lot of those situations, the defense wasn't expecting it and they fly by him and he's got an open lay in and, or he gets fouled, like you said, which kind of stops your momentum and naturally makes you uh, slow down. Uh, so I think that's been the case for most of his layups where he's done that this year. Now, it's good to see him do that, obviously, because he wasn't doing it earlier in the season. Um, he's done a much better job as the season goes on. So uh, between that and, you know, his shooting, just form improving, uh, just the look and feel of it. Uh, obviously, you know, he's putting in work to get better at those things. So that's encouraging that he's picking up on some of these things and improving within the season. Now it's just a matter of putting your head down this off season and and getting really good at this stuff and the sky's the limit if you can be, but I I just I don't know man it's it's tough like I, I I don't know does he have good touch or not even if he does learn how to decelerate obviously it'll help him slow down and not throw the ball as hard off the backboard but I still I won't know until I see it whether he has good touch or not I don't I, I don't think anyone really knows I think he has good enough touch where if he was shooting the right layups he would be finishing fine yeah and i think he's going to be a guy that's going to get to the line eight to nine times a game once he like fully learns how to get to the free throw line right and he's going to have some power finishes like it might be a situation where he doesn't even necessarily have to have good touch to be an efficient slasher because he's going to get to the free throw line and he's going to have opportunities to just go with power instead of touch, right? Um, so then you just hope that when he has to use touch that he knows when he has to use touch and can just be like okay enough to make some of those lay-ins because he'll get to the free throw line, he'll get power finishes, that's where his efficiency is going to come from. And yeah. you basically have to make defenders defend really, really well to not let him finish strong and not send him to the free throw line. That is where I ultimately think he'll get. And we've... I've just I've seen plays as a rookie where he decelerates and shoots with okay touch mm-hmm. that that's why I'm not really worried about it you know it's it's there's multiple steps he needs to take to become an efficient finisher but I think he has the potential I think he has um, enough talent to be able to get there and I think it's just going to come with time um, yeah I think if you look at a player in this league that is one of, if not the best passers in the league. And um, he's a point guard who uh, a lot, a lot of the knock on him coming into this season, at least was that he didn't shoot enough or didn't take over enough. um, And maybe should be a little more selfish than he is at times. And I'm talking about Tyrese Halliburton. Um, I think maybe Scoot could benefit from, maybe talking about him shooting not enough versus man, he's shooting 20, 30 times in some of these games, you know, like uh, maybe like pick your spots better and make the right play. Like right now you're kicking to Chris Murray. Like you mentioned, yeah. uh, you know, you have great points, but if it's the right play, it's the right play. Right. So it, it doesn't matter if the guy makes it right now, you're trying to learn how to do it. Yep. I don't know. I just yeah. End of the end of the day. Sorry, I wasn't ready to to speak there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my kids are going to bed. I just got home. I gotta say goodnight real quick. It's all good. All good. I mean, end of the day, I think people kind of discount the the body positioning aspect of having touch in the first place. Like you gotta you gotta have enough control. To shoot the ball sure. with touch with your body. 
Because if you're if you're out of control and like falling over and stuff, like you're not going to be able to control the way you shoot the ball off the glass. Sure, and I also don't but... think touch is something that you can't work on and can't get better at either. Oh, of course, yeah. I'm so. Not... I'm not he, saying that, but... He looks like he has pretty good touch on his free throws and his jump shots right now. Like, some of these yeah. some of these threes he's shooting, like, the ball's coming out of his hand pure. Like, I, I I don't think he's doomed from a touch standpoint at all. I just think a lot of these shots where he's just throwing it wildly off the glass, it's... um, A lot of it is a body positioning thing, and mm. I'll try and showcase that with his review video. All right, look forward to that. I'm going to have to actually leave a note to make sure I include that. His review video might be a little, little long. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, man, that corner three he had in the first half, that step back, far corner three, that was like a Dame step back move. The way he shot that and flowed into that was very Dame-like. Yeah, kind of look like Anthony, too. Uh, not that that's different. It's, it's very yeah. the same. But Anthony has that kind of... Because Dame kind of does an all-in-one motion, but Anthony has more of that, like, James Harden-looking one where it's, like, almost a travel. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, uh, that one was very – it reminded me a lot of Anthony, the way he shoots. Yeah. Um, that that he, he had amazing <laughs> – Yeah. I mean, it was – he yeah. looked like he had pretty good touch on that heave, bro. <laughs> yeah, but that was a heave. Hey. He I mean, it's, it's, I'm glad he made it, but... It didn't look... I don't know. He, he shot it at the rim. Like, he, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Like, how much of that is luck and how much of that is, like, uh, just a good shot? I don't know. I mean, it's a good shot. I'm not... I'm, because when you shoot a ball like that, though, at the end of the clock or whatever... Uh, Smoothest looking three of the season. For him. When you shoot a when you shoot a ball like that, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to shoot the three from now on or anything like that. Hey, I don't think you'd ever see Moses Brown hitting that shot. That's all I'm gonna say. Well, of course not. <laughs> I don't even think you'd see him hit that type of shot from five feet out, let alone 30, 40? I don't even know how deep that three was. I mean, let's. If Scoot starts consistently hitting forty foot jump shots, yeah, I think oh, we're, the best, we're late. they might be the best player of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed, man. Fingers crossed. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Um Do you do you see what I'm talking about with his shot just looking smoother though? Yeah, I mean it definitely looks improved. Uh that's what for him to do that in season, I think is very positive. Um, I don't know if it's just a confidence thing or what, but it it's uh it's definitely smooth. Yeah, and it, it's giving me hope. Yeah, I don't know. I have hope, but <laughs> but at the same time, it is. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of his threes. Are, I mean, that's what's cool about the step back one or the heave, but <laughs> a lot of his other threes. Maybe not in this game, but leading up to this game, have been like practice <laughs> three point shots because there's not a defender near him. But uh, yeah, uh, it's it's cool when he's hitting the the sidestep or step back once. I think he gets tired, and he seems to have struggled with efficiency more so in fourth quarters lately than earlier in the games like he's had a lot of games where i feel like he started hot and then kind of slowly faded as the game went on i think maybe just uh you know he needs to stay in shape this off season and he needs to be a guy that is able to play like he does in third and fourth quarters like he did in first halves the past couple of weeks because there definitely seems to be a trend with him fading a little bit especially in fourth quarters and we saw that today he was 10 for 20 missed his final three shots then gets subbed out um missed missed his first three and he missed it badly short so i do wonder if there's an element of fatigue that has come into play with some of his performances trailing off going into fourth quarters i mean it's been three 
uh, or two two years prior to this one to plan a G League schedule. Yeah. Um, so he's definitely not used to 82 games and stuff like that. So got to get used to that. But you know what I think it is? And this is something that is easily fixable. Um, it's not going to really... It's not going to be easy for Scoot in particular to fix this just because of the way he is um, and his personality and stuff. But that can also be because you're using a lot of energy being amped up early in games. And then that is hard to sustain for for, for a full game where you're just always jacked up, always uh, going at it, you know, and... And in this game, you know, Dylan Brooks and him were kind of going at it. So he gets into the game. His first summer league game, he's amped up. He's He comes out hot, right? And, uh, you know, there's been several games, like you mentioned, first half he comes out uh, <laughs> all, all excited. And um, it just seems like he's, like, maybe – because that, that's the Dame thing, right? Dame, uh, you know, he got a little more – uh, expressive as he got comfortable, but his first few years in the NBA, uh, Dame was like, you couldn't tell how good of a game he was having or what was going on in the game. He was always the same way. And I think that helped Dame become such a good clutch player um, because he didn't exhaust all his energy in the first quarter um, trying to like come out of the game just swinging and stuff like that, and so maybe at some point Scoop probably needs to learn how to manage his energy to where it's more even keel throughout the game. You can still be amped up, you can still be excited for your teammates, just maybe not as excessive as he does. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um... Him having more shooting around him and placing more of an emphasis on the simple kick-out pass uh, instead of trying to finish against three defenders will be one thing he can do to preserve mm-hmm. energy. Um, I I feel like there's been times where he's just trying to establish himself as a scorer. Yeah. I think he'll get to a point where he's comfortable and confident enough with his scoring ability that he stops trying to establish himself so much and he purely is just making reads more so than he does right now. It's kind of like the Banton thing in a way, right? Where, like, right. Banton is really bad in that regard. I, I don't think Scoot is like Banton. No. Um, Scoot definitely passes the ball more, but I feel like he has embraced this year being a learning experience for him as a scorer, just, like, trying to put points on the board in a way. Yeah, and that's, that's why I talk, brought up Tyrese Halliburton a little bit ago. So I, I want him to be more like that mindset, at least at the beginning of games. Like... You don't need to score. Like I, I I've never because that's always the thing. Um, we got this question, you know, hundreds of times in the off season. How many points is Scoot gonna average? How many points? And I was always, always like, I don't want him to average like twenty points this year or whatever. Like, or maybe not even ever. Like I, I think, you know, more of that Chris Paul range where you're kind of teetering on twenty points. I think is is a good place for Scoot to be if he's averaging you know, in his prime 12 to 13 assists a game or something. Um, I, I just think it's a nice balance if you have those other scores. Now, if you don't have the other scores, like right now, uh, sure, go ahead and score all you want. But eventually, I think Scoot's best, if he's a peak player, I don't think he's averaging like 30 points a game like Russell Westbrook did. Uh, I think he's he's more in the lower 20s. Um, with extreme playmaking ability and just really good uh, tempo and and control of the offense. Yeah, I agree. Um, my uh, my biggest, most optimistic hope, I guess, is he becomes like a twenty five and ten guy. Right? Yeah, that's you know optimistic for sure. But I think he has the potential, right? Like ceiling. I think he's like a twenty five and ten guy. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, shout out to Scoot. Love that he played well tonight. We'll see what he has in the season finale. Do you think he ends up playing in Summer League? Man, I don't know. I I didn't think Shaden was going to last year, and he did. Yeah. 
I could see him playing. We've seen more and more like yeah, it's becoming year, less third time year to, players yeah. play in summer league. So yeah, I mean, I can see him dominating summer league. You see the way he dominates like some third string guys. Mm-hmm. And I could see him just destroying if he plays in summer league. But see, I want. I mean, I don't want Shaden to play this summer. I mean, it's fine if he plays a game or something. They might, honestly, with him not being able to yeah. come back this season from that injury. Right, but so Eric Old says, "What's the point?" Um, I'm assuming you're talking about Scoop playing in summer league. Okay, let's say we get lucky, like in your sim. You take it on Sim and Detroit stupid and we get Sarit too or or whatever. Like I wanna I think more the more they can get going playing with each other right away, um who we whoever we pick. Um obviously with two lottery picks, if we keep both of them, those need to be integral parts of the of the future, right? Hopefully. So like this is our this is our team. Like start playing these guys together more. So um, I think obviously Chris needs it. Um, I'm fine with Tumani playing a little bit. Uh, Repair is obviously going to play summer league. Um, <clears throat> so get Scoop, go with those guys, the two rookies. Uh, you maybe have a couple of second round picks. Maybe they're two way guys. Maybe they're stashes, but they could still play summer league. And you can just get those guys going right now in July. Uh, you know comfortable with each other yep yep i agree um any other players you want to talk about that played tonight there really wasn't anyone else who had a good game <laughs> i saw banton had what 28 yeah or did... nine for 26 <laughs> it's <laughs> uh yeah uh they said uh that was his lowest scoring output against houston this year though yeah crazy that's why <laughs> Um. Yeah, I mean, I pretty much I heard you go through them. Um, you know, it was unfortunate Jabari got hurt and probably I guess sit out last game. Um, so Scoop Scoop got hurt. I didn't see him on the sideline. I side think line. he got like knee in his quad or something. It didn't seem serious. But I thought I thought Chauncey pulled a shade and sharp against was it against Memphis last year where he. <laughs> Sat in the last ten minutes and we ended up losing or something. Yeah, I mean, whatever game that was where Sharp was just like dominating. Yeah, it it was a little interesting. Like Jabari goes out and then Aiton goes out and then Scoot goes out. Like, <laughs> right, they just all happen to get injured while we have half our team injured. Yeah, but like I don't think any of those guys necessarily needed to go out for us to lose this. Right, because we were down we ten down. mostly. Yeah, we got destroyed in the second quarter. So, yeah. But, I mean... <sighs> Man, I was really worried about us winning this game. Thankfully, they pulled pulled out the L, the L right? Yeah. Yeah. Since, since we brought up Summer League... Oh my goodness, ESPN stopped playing ads. Um, since we brought up Summer League, I think this Summer League could actually be... A tryout for a rotation spot, depending on how the offseason shakes out. Oh, for sure. I think, and do you know who I'm going to say it would be between? Chris and Repair and uh, Tamani? I was well, going to, no, I don't think Tamani's in that. I don't, yeah. I was going to say Chris and if Jabari plays. Yeah. Like, Jabari's ahead of him, but you expect Chris to make up a little bit of ground going from year one to year two. I just don't think Jabari will play. I think it's probably 50-50. I don't know. He's still young. He's still not, like, fully established. He's going to need to continue to work on that three-point shot. If he plays, I think they could view it as a bit of a tryout. Yeah. Because they're not going to be able to play both next year if they're healthy. Yeah. They might not even be able to play one of them. I don't really know exactly how they handle that position. So if Jabari plays, it's going to be interesting just to compare them. If Chris plays, obviously he has to knock down threes. 
Chris needs to rework his shot. I'm kind of at the point where I don't have much faith in Chris Murray panning out. I know I didn't before, but even like now, I, I just don't see his pathway to becoming a rotation player when you got Jabari, you got Jeremy, you could draft a four. Something to watch. You good? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I just <laughs> had to say goodnight to the other kid. Oh, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't uh kind of questionable attire for the stream so i wanted to make sure yeah, <laughs> that it yeah, yeah. gets shown on screen so yeah thank you just looking out yeah Good <laughs> i don't know like i don't i don't think repairs in the rotation next year i don't think chris murray's in the rotation next year i mean unless he improves a ton he shouldn't be chris or repair crit chris yeah no 100 percent, man 100%. Like, I could see this ending with them declining his option next offseason. Like, well, no, they have to pick that up early, huh? Chris? Yeah, because it's a team option the final two years of his rookie contract. When do they have to pick that up? Uh, By the beginning, the first game of the season, I think. I don't see him declining it before then, though. No, they're going to pick up his third year. Yeah. If he's bad again next year, I could see him declining his fourth year. But but this is where it's interesting for me because Jabari's going into the last year of his deal next year. They're going to pick up Chris's option. He's going to have two years left on his D deal. Like, do they move off Jabari, like maybe trade him to a team that's willing to give him a second or two or whatever? I don't know. That's probably what his trade value is. Are they willing to do that to clear the room to justify playing Chris Murray because they have him another couple of years and they spent a first round pick on him. Like how much do they try and justify that cost? Because it's, it, it already looks pointless, Eric. Yeah. Using that. Pick well, that's on always the looks concern. Completely pointless. I mean, can't say <laughs> you didn't say that at the time, right? Dude, I said, well, here, hold on. I'm going to, hold on. Just wait. I'm going to play do something. I, do I need to listen to the stream? You're going to you're gonna need to listen to the stream. I actually oh. looked this up earlier today. You're, you're, I'm going to look up my draft stream. Okay. And I'm going to put it in a YouTube transcript. YouTube transcriptor. Okay. Actually, I don't even need to do that because I saved the timestamp. Sparkling. He's... I'm going to play what I said before the 23rd pick. Because it's kind of funny, not going to lie. We're driving Dame at it. I'm All just right. ready. Here, here, here we go. Here we go. It was like pick 13, right? I remember I foreshadowed us picking Chris Murray, but I never actually went and listened to it back until today. Right? I think the Pelicans And the this Pel is this is what it was. I think the Pelicans are going to take I'm just ready for here? like like oh, well, we're driving Dame out of town, but at 23 we're going to select Chris Murray. <laughs> You know how bad, mad I would be at that pick if we're going the yeah. rebuild route? Like, <laughs> we're going to go a guy who's like a role player to a win now role player, if anything, and that's it. But they didn't work out anyone for the 23rd pick, so I don't know what they plan on doing with that pick. Yeah. Yeah. You remember, they didn't work out anybody for that pick. They just decided to take Chris Murray. As they entered a rebuild. I said that 10 picks before that pick, I'd be pissed. Because why are we taking Chris Murray if we're entering a rebuild, Eric? It was funny listening to that back. Can you please stop doing that for worst case scenario? Can you just like be like, oh, watch this. We're going to we're gonna be third and get someone like Alex Sar or something. Because he's going to fall to three and we're just going to take him. Can you just say that instead? Please? See, I have to mean it. 
<clears throat> I have to mean it. I, I don't uh, know if I'd believe that. Like, I at that time when I said it, I'm like, well, I kind of believed it. But and no, when I said, but, watch, we're getting Kevin Knox last deadline. <laughs> I believe you did, that. You did too. not believe we were getting Kevin Knox. Shut up. Like, that was kind <laughs> you were of just throwing, You were throwing out that as a <laughs> joke, and a completely <laughs> random joke, and we somehow <laughs> trade for him. Well, well, I mean, wasn't he got traded to the Warriors, and then there is, I think, a tweet about them rerou- rerouting him, and there was the whole GP2 saga, and I made the joke because well, like, yeah, that, watch, we're going <laughs> to. But it wasn't like. He's on Detroit. Watch us end up with him like before there was he got traded to to Golden State. Yeah, I don't remember, man. I I mean No, I but kinda, I mean I kind of want to do it again even if it's bad. If we're going to yeah. if Cronin's going to do bad things, I might as well just predict it before it happens. Cuz I give people time to absorb the badness. So it doesn't all hit them at once. I'm actually trying to do people a favor, Eric. And then people will say it's hindsight that you didn't like the 23rd pick. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, No, no, yeah. This is... Oh, Travis, oh God! Travis yeah, brought up what we want to say. We're gonna we're gonna get the frick, no, <laughs> We're gonna get the number one freaking pick, and we're gonna take Donovan Klingon over Alex <laughs> Sar. Like this, this is what's gonna happen now. Thanks a lot, man. And then and then so Aiton's the starting center. We play our number one pick, who's like high floor, low upside, NBA ready guy. We're gonna play him like 15 minutes a game, and then we're gonna play Robert Williams at the four next to him, and none of the guys shoot threes. Yeah. And then we're going to play a 12-man rotation. We're going to play Chris Murray at the three. And then we're we're not going to play Thibault despite paying him a contract we never should have matched him for. And Sharp's yep. going to come off the bench. And Chauncey's going to be here for all of it. All right, yeah, two questions for you. The, the Tankathon Sim happens. Detroit takes Risha Shea. And we take Klingon over Sar. What? What's your reaction? Or what is your reaction if we uh, took Ricochet over Sar in a scenario Legitimate. <laughs> where they're both on the board? I am. I am slightly higher on Klingon than I am Ricochet right now. I would be more pissed if we took Klingon over Sar because it's like you already got your center. You can get a guy who's just as good of a rim protector as Klingon, plus a better perimeter defender, plus he has a chance at being able to play next to Aiton, and instead you're going to get a guy that can't play next to Aiton and doesn't have shooting potential and can't defend the perimeter as well just because of his shot blocking? And he's older? And he's had he had foot problems last year and we're the Blazers drafting a big man who had foot problems? Great. Dude, I can't even give you my actual reaction because I would be so infuriated. I would say multiple curse words. Yeah, we have the we have a player in SAR that could potentially <laughs> be the difference between being able to keep a smaller backcourt or not. And we're going <laughs> to just pass on that. Yeah, it would be, you know be what horrific. It's- if I predict something that's right, you know it's probably going to be? There's going to be, like, rumors about the Blazers trading the 13th pick for, like, five or six different role players. And it's going to be, like, the worst one out of the six. I'm, I'm going to be able to call which role player it is. It's going to be, like, 13th pick for, like... <laughs> Eric... Cam Johnson. Well, well, he's a free agent this offseason, but <laughs> there's a player that if he wasn't a free agent this offseason, if we could trade the 13th pick for him, would be hilarious for us to trade for for multiple reasons. Who's that? I want to see if anyone in chat can guess it. Like, like there's multiple, there's multiple reasons why it would be hilarious. If this player wasn't a free agent this offseason. You got to think about Joe Cronin's history, Eric. Yeah, I And think about previous offseasons. Do you know who I'm talking about? Bruce Brown? 
Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that was a wild guess. Yep. Because there's a whole thing about Cronin, like, disrespecting him so then he went to Denver instead and we signed GP2 and it's like another guard another defensive guard yeah that can't shoot well I guess he can shoot sometimes kind of shoot but it's just like why are we adding him you know so yeah yeah Brogdon in 13 for Bruce Brown (laughs) luckily Bruce Brown's a free agent but yeah Bruce Bruce was who was on my mind that's funny Jared Vanderbilt is a good guess yeah um I mean, that that's what I'm worried about with the Warriors pick. Listen, if they're dead set on trading the Warriors pick, I kind of hope it moves up into the top four. We'll see. Dude, are you as fascinated by this offseason as I am? Oh, it's going to be... Uh, <laughs> it's going to be stressful, but yeah, it's like, I don't know. You know what they say? It's going to be a movie. <laughs> it might be a horror movie. Yeah. It just... might be a comedy. See, I'm, I want to trust Cronin and Schmitz with the draft. But, I mean, we're talking about the Pelicans pick in that clip you played, right? At the beginning of that clip. So it was like 10 picks before our pick, right? Were they at 13 or something? It was the Raptors pick at 13, right before they took Grady Dick. Okay, so, yeah, 10 picks before, and we're already, like, talking about, and, and we knew this, like, we we talked about this many times, about the Blazers sending, like, mixed signals about what they're doing and don't have a plan, it's, it's like, they're doing stuff that makes sense if you're trying to keep Dame, but doesn't make sense if you're rebuilding and don't, not wanting to take a step back, but all their moves are step backs, and and tanking how is that not rebuilding uh, for three seasons i i don't know uh, but like we you literally saw it coming 10 picks before ours mm-hmm. and like so like how can you trust that that like yeah. we knew that was the worst thing possible to do with the 23rd pick it would we would have better off trading it for a pick back or something like i don't know but it, it's just I don't know, man. <laughs> it, it, like, I just, something about just the fact that we did that. We took Scoot and Repair, which was, like, great at yeah. both of those spots. But, like, why did we take Chris Murray then? Like, <laughs> I just, yeah. I, so I don't know. Like, you know, are we going to take a good player? Like, are we going to make a good pick with our first pick and then do something really stupid with the, <laughs> with the Gold State pick? Um, yeah, I don't know, man. Crazy, crazy stuff, man. Crazy stuff. Um, yeah, I need to stop conjuring up bad scenarios. That's my bad. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Um, since we're on the first pick, I want to take a look at a couple things over on BetUS. Okay, because they have odds for the first overall pick, and it's actually really, really interesting to look at. Um, let me load that up real quick. Cause you got some guys, man. You got some guys that have some <laughs> surprising thought, odds. I thought about that first Connor. He said he was going to guess GP two. I thought about that <laughs> first because that would be the fun. Uh, I mean, that would, that would suck, but that would be hilarious if we traded. Oh, I'd laugh my that. ass off. Like, <laughs> like, because it's it would basically be one of those things where it's it was like okay you see now that this GM is bad and if people <laughs> actually tried to defend it then it would just be hilarious. Yeah. Like. But, uh, <laughs> like what are we doing? But, but that so but thinking that is what led me to that's the only reason why I thought of Bruce Brown is because like I remembered that it came down to those two and real quick for for those that don't know so. Um, what allegedly happened, allegedly, is that uh, the Blazers came down to two players, Gary Payton II and Bruce Brown, to give most of their mid-level exception to, they were trying to give as much as they could, but stay under the tax. And it would have been, 
I think what it was like a three year, $27 million deal or something. They end up giving GP two. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bruce Brown thought he was going to get that contract from Portland. Um, but Gary Payton, the second was coming off a championship and they told Bruce Brown that they were going with the winning player, <laughs> Gary Payton, the second, they didn't say Bruce wasn't a winner, but they they said that they liked the fact that Gary Payton had championship experience or whatever. And then Bruce Brown ends up having to sign the taxpayer mid level for only five million instead of eight something um, in the much bigger contract. So we we actually would have had Bruce Brown under contract for three years, um, and that. I think we made the playoffs last year. Things are completely different. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Um, so after Bruce Brown wins a championship, he's, he <laughs> immediately, right after the game, makes a comment about a GM who told me he wasn't a winner. Like, what, what do you think of me now? All that kind of stuff. Now, a little bit of that was Bruce – or Crota didn't say he wasn't a winner yeah. They just went with Gary Payton, who was coming off of winning the championship, and Bruce Brown took it the wrong way. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> he definitely thought he got, he was going to get paid. Now, it worked out for Bruce Brown because he ended up getting, what, $20 million or something this year? Yeah. Um, so it, he ended up getting more or the same amount of money over two years that he would have gotten in a three-year contract with us. But, um, but it definitely was a decision that Joe Cronin made. Bruce Brown was ready to sign with us for the same amount that Gary Payton did. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it'd be funny to trade the Warriors pick for Bruce Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We talked we talk about this like once or twice on stream. Yeah. It should have went with Bruce Brown over GP2. That free agency day, there was rumblings about the Blazers having interest in Bruce Brown. Um, so yeah, they, they've been after that six, two to six, five wings, not guards wings. Cause GP two is more of a wing than a guard six, two to six, five wings that have questionable shots that play defense. Mm-hmm. They got the two worst ones out of the three that I have in mind with that archetype. They got Thibel and they got GP two weeks. They didn't get Bruce Brown. Bruce Brown was the only one worth getting. <laughs> But we get off to that good start that year without Gary Payton playing until, what was it, January 3rd or something that he plays yeah. his first game? No, I think it was like, like imagine... the 29th of December, yeah. Or, or no, it was like January that. 2nd. No, it was January 2nd. Yeah. And, uh, and just imagine if we had a player like Bruce Brown contributing to that yeah. team yeah. with that hot start. And then we had all those injuries. If Our depth would have been a lot better and all that kind of stuff. So would have been... Uh, uh very very different had uh had we signed him i think and we probably still have dame here but maybe man i mean butterfly effect like but, that stuff can play a big difference down the line yeah and then and we end up we sign we signed someone who needed core surgery like that makes no sense dude yeah. what why is corona never questioned on this i i just i don't understand why because the people that would do the questioning don't want to make them look bad. Yeah. That's 100% what it is. The problem is when your media reporters with credentials want the GM to look good, they're going to do their job differently. Mm-hmm. It's a problem. Talked about it last post game stream. <laughs> um, but yeah. Interesting, man. Interesting. Let's take a look at uh, number one pick odds. Over on BetUS. Shut Uh, the F up, or (laughs) Dro. Dro out here giving Dro wants a freaking timeout. Shots, man. No. (laughs) Look, I have hair. Yeah, Eric's not bald. Don't ever freaking call me Joe Cronin again. But if you want to bet on Eric going bald in the next year, maybe you can uh, get a line on that over on BetUS. When will Eric Brandt officially go bald? I want that line. I'll bet you. <laughs> you would have bet like 
seven years ago when I met you. Yeah, I would have. <laughs> I would have bet of... like like over under four and a half years. I'm taking the under. And look at you. Look at you now. You still got hair past four and a half years. So I'm proud of you. Um, maybe maybe I would take the over now. I trust in your ability to maintain your hair now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, ain't no way. Ball before me. Ain't no, bro. Ain't no way. I mean, come on. It ain't, it, no, 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 no way. Look at, look at all this. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do this without the hat on. Um, shout out to BetUS for sponsoring this post game stream. They're still offering you a phenomenal deal. If you haven't get got in on it yet, you need to with NBA playoffs right around the corner. They're offering you three 125% deposit matches up to $2,500 on your first three deposits. Okay. So you deposit a hundred dollars, you get $125 of extra money on top of it. That's $225. You get that three times, not one, not two, but three times. So if you want to get in on the NBA playoffs, now's a great time to, and we're going to take a look at a couple other interesting things that you can get in on with bet us. They also give you 24 seven customer service and 24 hour payouts we're also giving away up to $125 in free play. The first five people to DM me their account number on Twitter or on Discord. Their BetUS account number will receive $25 in free play on top of that. So they're trying to hook you up with a great deal. Um, and this is interesting to look at, Eric. Number one pick odds. The favorite, plus 110, Zachary Risache. Okay. Alex Sar right behind him, plus 120. That means if you bet $100, you get 120 back if you bet on SAR. Okay, next, Nikola Topic at plus 500. Then Cody Williams at plus 600. Then Donovan Klingon at plus 1,200. There's a couple of players that I'm surprised as to how good of odds people can get on them. And that is Buzelis at plus 3,000 and Ron Holland at plus 3,000. I think there is still a small chance that one of those guys could work their way into being the number one pick, especially if somebody like Buzelis or somebody like Holland measures well. So to get plus 3,000 on those guys, Eric, I kind of like that. You toss in a 125% bonus on top of that. Um, that essentially, with a $100 deposit, makes it like plus... Oh, more than plus six thousand, right? So you can bet a hundred dollars. You could get paid six thousand dollars with that bonus if you bet on Buzelis or Holland. That's a pretty good payout. Pretty good payout. And with the draft being this wide open, I could see one of those guys working their way into being the top pick. I don't think it's likely, but I think those odds are too low. Why the heck is Kevin McCuller even on there? <laughs> Dude, they got some other. They got some. Stompsy. They got KJ Simpson. They got all sorts of names, man. Bronny James, Colin Murray Boyles, Jalen Tyson. Maybe I should get plus twenty thousand on my guy Jalen Tyson. But um, yeah, I mean, it's not gonna be any of these guys. But like, realistically, I think, I think it should go. Risa Shea and Shar are the top two. I think Dillingham, honestly, at plus 3,000. If the Spurs are picking one, I could see them going with Dillingham, bro. Like, he has a lot of upside. He'll be able to get Wemby the ball. Kentucky guard bomb. Did, did you see he's been reposting and liking, like, pics of him in Spurs jersey, and he said he wanted to play for San Antonio? Yeah. Yeah, I think he'd be a great get there. Um, it's funny because like Jacoby Walter is plus 2,200, which implies that he's more likely to go number one than Buzelis, Holland, or Dillingham. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case at all. Um, you guys can get in on this and maybe get a really good payout on Dillingham, Buzelis, or Holland. That's what I recommend. Um, I think Buzelis is most likely out of the three. Which one of those three, Dillingham, Buzelis, Holland, do you think is most likely to go number one, Eric? Zealous. Yeah. He's the biggest out of the three. He can handle the ball. Yeah, I think, you know, all it takes is him to shoot well and to work out and yeah. put some of those concerns behind. Mm -hmm. um, I, Holland, if he measures a legit 6'6 six -six without shoes, like you think he will, and he has a good wingspan and stuff, maybe. Maybe yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, 
I think Max would be six seven. If he can measure six seven, then, then you're putting him in that conversation. But like Collins, another guy where if he shoots well during a workout because he had shooting problems last year and he has a yeah. lot of other good traits. Um, I think it's gonna be hard for like. I think Buzelis and Holland have a lot more to gain from workouts than somebody like Reese Shea. Mm-hmm. And that's just shooting the ball well. Because I don't think Reese Shea is going to really wow people with like his creation ability in workouts. Mm-hmm. I mean, Buzelis wants to play Reese Shea one-on-one in workouts. <laughs> so, I don't think Reese Shea wants to do that. Yeah, so you it's don't interesting. Want that. Interesting. Um, you also have, there's a one other thing I wanted to look at over here on betus.com, which is no, it wasn't that NBA specials team to draft Bronny James. Where's Portland at near the bottom plus 4,000. I don't think Bronny James is draft worthy, but because he's LeBron's son, he might get drafted. If he wasn't, I don't think there's any chance he would get drafted. Um, but then also you can bet on team to be awarded the first pick of the draft lottery. So if you just want to roll with the Blazers plus 700, their odds moved up into a tie with the Spurs, but the Spurs are only plus 500, right? Obviously this has changed, but you can get in on plus 700 right now with the, the Blazers right now. Yeah. Yeah. They got an 11.5% chance right now. You know, that could be a fun way, not only celebrating the first pick, if you guys actually believe it's going to happen, you can get plus 700, 125% bonus that, you know, makes it $225 with a $100 deposit, plus 700 on $225 is, I'm going to bring out the calculator right now, um, $1,575 on a $100 deposit if the Blazers win the lottery, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good payout considering it's a 11.5% chance you actually know the odds you're getting on that. It's also funny because you got Houston via Brooklyn and Houston their own pick. <laughs> but yeah, um, you can get in on on the draft lottery if you want to. Could be a fun way to get in on it. Um, anyway, that's over at BetUS. Once again, link in the description box below to sign up. And uh, use promo code JOIN125 to activate those three deposit bonuses of 125% up to $2,500. Shout out to them for sponsoring the postgame stream. Get in on that action. It helps out the channel as well if you use that link to sign up and deposit. And then let me know if you want that free play, that $25 free play. Anyway, Eric. Yeah, $25 free play. Free free bets. Like, Why would you not want that? Exactly. DM Tory. Exactly. Hit me up. Um, I don't know what that last comment in chat means at all. <laughs> Not the Great Hughes one, the one above it. The belt. Belt huh. to ass tour? I don't know what that means. Gray, no. No. I don't even want to have that conversation. No. I mean, I, some people do think that. I, I don't think so. No. Um, I don't... Let me just say this about, like, women's and men's college basketball. I don't like comparing them. I don't like comparing them. I don't like having that conversation. It's... I love that women's college basketball got great viewership and is growing at a rapid pace in what Caitlin Clark's done for the game. She's phenomenal. She's a lot of fun to watch. I don't know why any time there's a successful female athlete, we have to be like, well, how would she do against boys, though? Yeah. Like, why can't we just appreciate that she's one of the most dominant players ever in college? And hopefully she has a great career. Like, we do this with every female athlete. I, I don't know. It just It doesn't make sense to me why we have to put her down by saying, no, there's no way she can compete with dudes. Like. Yeah. Like, why? Like, I mean, just let her play in her sport and be good at it. Like, uh, just, it's, it drives me crazy sometimes. Yep, 100%. 100%. I mean, if she if she wanted to try playing the NBA and, like, legitly had a chance to do it or whatever, like, fine. Like, I'll, I'll do that. But, yes, yeah, it's, it's stupid to even talk about it until that happens or if that happens. Yeah. Great. That's a different sport. Different sport. Um, 
But that that's my point, though. Like, well, but so we couldn't make the cut on the men's tour. Yeah, no crap, because she's playing with guys. Like, that doesn't mean she sucks at golf or something. Like, she's, she was good in her sport yeah. or whatever like, i don't know like why just, do, why do we always have to compare it to how she does against men 100 100 percent. um absolutely agree so i just i don't like doing those comparisons i don't like having those conversations i think i had a couple other people ask me that so that's kind of why i responded as well just asked i've had people bring that up on twitter it's yeah she's so good we have to talk about if she could play in the nba why don't we just talk about how great she is? Because she is she is a generational talent. A generational talent as a women's basketball player. And that should be celebrated. Anyway. Because then we have to get in the conversation as to like biology and all sorts of stuff. That's just... Why? Why? She's a great basketball player. Anyway. Um, do you think we should go for Cooper Flag next year? He'd be awesome. I also think Ace Bailey would be really, really good, Eric. Um, yeah, next year's draft is going to be fun. But I think the Blazers are trying to make a play in next year. <laughs> the good thing is that's going to be hard because Spurs are going to be better. Rockets are going to be better. Um, those are two teams that missed the playoffs. Like, the Blazers should probably be bottom three in the West next year, even if they do get better, Eric. Mm -hmm. But we'll see. Memphis will be healthy, right? They're a playoff team when healthy. That's another team. That missed the cut because of their injuries this year. So, it's going to be tough. Like, there is no bad teams in the West next year other than maybe the Blazers. I think the Spurs will be better. The Rockets will be better. Who am I forgetting? The Jazz. I think the Blazers and the Jazz are the bottom of the barrel next year. So, even if they do try and get better, Eric, it's going to be really hard to actually pass up some of those other teams. They're going to have to hope that a couple teams have injury bad injury luck like the Grizzlies had this year. Yeah. Or like the Clippers lose Paul George to the 76ers or something. Drew says, didn't you say the Spurs were a playing team tour? Yeah, I thought they would be because I thought Wemby would be great as a rookie and he has been. I thought it would just translate more to winning. They look like a playing Russia caliber team, team like the last two weeks though, Eric. So yeah. they just came back from 23 down to the Nuggets and the Nuggets were playing for something and healthy. Did you watch the end of that game? Did you see the I, I just saw the score at the end. Devontae Graham hit a game-winning floater with .9 left. Nice. Off like a... They got the ball with five seconds left, didn't call a timeout, and like hit, hit him with a hit-ahead pass. And he was like one-on-one -on -one against Jamal Murray and did a Euro step from like 10 feet out into a floater. It was weird. It was a weird like game-winning play. It was cool, though. It was cool. So if we end up with the number one pick, we, we owe Devontae Graham. I thank you. Yep. 100%. Wemby had like 17 points in three minutes, which was sick. Um, but yeah, also, I thought we were locked into fifth best odds. Well, someone on our in our comments and on our streams keeps saying Wemby was out for the rest of the year. And then... So I... <laughs> I saw the injury report... And I just assumed Wimby wasn't playing because of that, and so I picked the the Nuggets in that one. I'm washed. I don't even want to think about picks because I'm gonna have to wake up and do a pick stream like early on Sunday now. Ugh. Even though I'm done, I'm screwed. I choked. I choked. As long as I finish above 500, though. I kind of want Steven to win because I think it would be funny for Steven to take down chat the chat huh. that hates him that's a joke chat doesn't hate him you guys love steven has era posted a records from today nope uh circadian's asking if we're going to the hoop summit uh i'm trying to don't know for sure if i am going or not but i i do want to be there uh, I want to see Ulrich Chomsky versus uh, more the more so than those guys, just because I don't have any enough video on him. Yeah. And then Javier asked multiple times how we met <laughs> in this room. Um, 
the internet. Yeah. Well, yeah. So for like probably 15 to 18 years, I used to be on the Oregon live, um, blazer forum. Um, and that ended up, they end up shutting down comments and, and getting rid of all their forums and stuff. And, uh, they uh, are th- this guy who runs a different forum came and was like, "Hey, all you guys should come talk on this forum. It's the official yeah. forum of the Blazers and all that." So I started posting on there. Obviously, you know, Tori was on there, and we started talking. And then uh, very early on, Tori mentioned something about a three-on-three team, and I told him I'd be interested in it. And so we ended up playing in the three-on-three tournament. And we practiced for that, so that's how we got to know each other in person. But yeah, um, yeah, that's basically how it started. Yeah, and then I was like, "Why don't we put this guy on a podcast and see what happens?" And now we're here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, you had the foresight to to see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you were always talking about like CBA and draft prospects and stuff, so I knew it was a good fit in terms of like the way I nerd out about basketball, and I knew there was people out there that wanted a more in-depth approach to prospects and knowing trades and that sort of thing. I always felt like there was an audience for that, so yeah, that was that was the thought process behind that. Connor says F in the chat for Rip City 3 and 3. Yeah, dude, like the first year of the channel we had that, and since then we have not. And it would be a lot of fun having the channel as big as the channel is to do something like that. Especially and... like, cause I, I don't know. I mean, I guess this might not be the case, but I have a feeling like we'd get a ton of people show up to, <laughs> yeah, to watch us, cool. you know, it'd like in person. Yeah. yeah. It just could be an event. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I always said I would do like a, a cheesy like documentary style video for it that would just be like purposefully um cheesy you Crazy. know what i mean like it would just be funny um yeah like not hopefully not too cringe but like you know cringe on purpose in a way that's funny like <laughs> oh, i don't know like i always was curious what we could do for content you know what i mean with something like that but uh yeah Nah, nah, it's it's over, I guess. It's Jover. Joe Cronin came in, and now it's Jover. Um, so. To watch a sweaty Eric cuss the refs out every possession? Yes, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, Eric will get us kicked out of the tournament. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. No, you weren't trying to fight anybody, though. That was Damani. That was yeah. Damani. But it made for really good clickbait. Oh yeah, it did. <laughs> Back in my Yeah. You guys got you guys can go find the video on this channel of our Rip City three on three the last time that it happened. Cause there's two videos for both days that are up and um Yeah, the second one my thumbnails weren't as good. Man, could you imagine the way I can make thumbnails now with, like, the way I could have clickbaited because there was almost a fight on day two? Yeah. Yeah. Connor, we will. I tried to secure, like, a gym, an indoor gym, the gym me and Steven played at, but unfortunately that didn't work out. I want to secure an indoor gym, though. But, so if anybody knows anybody that can actually access a gym that we could actually get runs at, that'd be cool couple courts anyway i'm tired eric i'm gonna end this stream we'll be live again on sunday we'll be live again on monday night blazers press live will transition to evening times approximately nine or between nine and nine thirty on monday and thursday nights monday night on blazers press live we'll have reaction to exit interviews and then Thursday night, we'll have our playoff predictions, our annual playoff predictions. <coughs> so that should be a lot of fun. And then future episodes, we'll just cover the playoffs, talk about stuff, talk about Blazer rumors if they pop, pop up, talk about draft combine stuff. When we get around to that, that's what shows are going to be in the offseason on top of daily video content. 
on the radio between the end of the game and uh, when you started the stream, I think I heard them say that they're going to do some of the extra interviews just as post-game interviews again. again. Yeah. I don't know how that'll work since they're on Lazy. the road. Lazy! They're on the road, though, so I don't know how they're going to do that. But... They're, it's Hopefully lazy. that's not true. If they do, especially with it being on the road, Eric, it's laziness. Yeah. Like, stop being lazy. Like, like, there's so many things where I feel like this organization is just getting lazier. The court is one of them. They can't even polish their own freaking court. Oh, God, I'm getting mad. In the outro, I'm getting annoyed. I'm tired of the laziness from this organization. Just come back, fly back to Portland, set up exit interviews the day after, and do them like you always did them. Why is that so hard to do, Eric? Well, last year, they were obviously trying to avoid getting any type of questions about their offseason. Yep. And I imagine that might be the case this year. I hope hope not. But, uh, yeah, we need a, we need the extra interview because uh, I think I saw Rich in here earlier say that he was having surgery. Uh, he has his date set for his surgery. Um, so... That's on the 29th, I think. Uh, so if you see Rich or whatever, wish him well. But um, we need that one more Cronin press conference to where uh, Rich can do a video about all the lies he tells in this one um, or all the contradictions he has uh, before Rich goes down for surgery for a while. <laughs> yep. Hopefully that goes well, Rich. I saw he donated earlier. Um, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully all is good there, Rich. Um, Watch them just flat out avoid using the rebuild. Oh, they will. Yeah. They've yeah. done it this far. Yeah. I'm ready for the off season chat. Are you guys excited for the off season, or are you sad that the season's ending? I'm gonna do a chat poll on the way out. How? How are you feeling about the? Season ending and the off season beginning. Excited, relieved, <laughs> sad, and I have no emotions left. Those are four good options, Eric. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I'm always sad when the season's over just as a basketball fan but I always hate that period between when it ends when you don't make the playoffs and when like actual moves start happening or like the lottery I guess that about it's about a month period where there's nothing going on and even though you could technically trade with other teams that aren't in the playoffs anymore it, rarely i think it's happened like once uh where a trades happen that before the playoffs are over so uh yeah it's just kind of there's not a lot of news but hopefully we get some good uh juicy rumors and uh we get some good sound bites from exit interviews slash post game interviews whatever they decide to do yep i'm excited to see what the hell happens this offseason i'm excited for the playoffs i would vote excited 30 percent of people have voted excited 35 percent of people have voted relieved 20 percent of people sad uh 19 of people say i have no emotions left i was sad like the last couple years when the season ended and especially it's like oh the post game shows are ending you know what i mean it's it's like there's something a little sad about that this year i don't have that same sadness we're st still going to be streaming and the past couple years is like, man, why am I sad? We're still streaming twice a week and doing video content and have off-season streams, right? So it's not like we're going anywhere. But I still felt like a sadness in terms of like, this is our final post-game show of the year. I don't think I'm going to have that feeling on Sunday, Eric. I think it's just yeah. going to be a relief. And I'm excited for the off-season to be underway. Um, so that's how I'm feeling going into things. Okay, man, you've been around long enough to know. Yes, we have... Monday, Thursday, sometime between 9 and 10 usually, we go live at in the evening. Every Monday and Thursday in the off-season. Yep. And we're doing that on the main channel because we have sponsors, which is great. 
So we're doing our main channel this year. Shout out to BetUS. Link in the description box below. Um, check that out. They're still offering you three deposit matches up to 125%, up to uh, $2,500. And remember to message me if you want that $25 free play. And then also shout out to Mansa Sleep Mask. Starcadian in chat said, I wish I had a Mansa Sleep Mask during this entire season so I could sleep through it. Well, why don't you have a Mansa Sleep Mask? Because promo code Uprise gives you 10% off and the link is in the description box below to go buy yourself one. I've only heard good things from the people that have bought it. So it helps out the channel as well using that code and supporting any of our sponsors is it means a lot to us because they help keep the lights on, you know? So shout out to Manta. Shout out to BetUS. Shout out to you guys. One game left. Sunday. We'll catch you with that. We'll have a picks against the spread stream before that. Luckily, Eric will be there for that because it's been rough doing 14 and 15 games the last couple of picks Sorry. against the spread streams. No, I mean, it's... I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. It's just computer problems and internet problems and it's just a mess, right? So, luckily, we'll have you there for that. We'll do 15 games of picks against the spread Sunday morning. We'll go live like 9.45 in the morning. Um, and then we'll have a post game stream after the Kings game that'll be live around three. We'll go for probably two and a half hours and wrap up the season and then stream in Monday. Blazers Uprise live right here on the main channel as well as off season content. And then I wanted to do recap video for like the past year because I didn't do one for last off season. I wanted to do that on Monday. It's just a lot of work goes into that video, so I'm actually going to put that off a few days into the offseason. We'll have other videos, though. Mail back on Monday. Be ready for a prompt for that. Haven't done one of those in a while. Um, as well as reactions to preseason predictions. We'll have a Blazers Pulse episode. We'll take a look at, like, team stats from the past season and see where the Blazers did well, see where the Blazers struggled, take a look at analytics like that. Also have a video talking about which pieces I think are foundational pieces and which pieces aren't in terms of players and then we'll get into review videos which the the player review videos are going to be really good this off season so hopefully hopefully you guys check those out and enjoy those because there's a lot of work going into those and uh yeah that's why i'm excited for the off season and uh excited for the draft streams because it's two days this year excited for the lottery stream excited for free agency because i expect us to do nothing but we can actually like sit back and not be upset about doing nothing you know <laughs> Well, we don't have the, oh, we have to make a huge trade. And you kind of don't want there to be a huge trade unless it's yeah, it's a Grant different Thibel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want us to sell this offseason if we do anything. Yeah, it's a different feel, and that's also why I'm excited for the offseason, just to see what it's like with, without the same expectations and being actually in a rebuild and hopefully committed to a rebuild and seeing what happens under that. So looking forward to the off season, but we have one more stream left. Hopefully we're able to catch you guys on Sunday. Anything else hurt? Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, happy to see all of you in here. Thank you for supporting us through this crappy season. And uh, <laughs> I hope to catch you on either or both streams on Sunday. Yep. We reached 60 losses tonight. Good job, Blazers. And we get fourth best lottery odds because of it. Well, not purely. Tie for fourth best lottery odds. Hopefully the uh, the Spurs beat the Pistons on Sunday and the Blazers lose to the Kings. So the Kings stay above the Warriors. And so that the Blazers get sole possession of fourth best lottery odds and get that top 4% up to 48%. That would feel pretty good. Moving up one spot in the lottery chances each year, Eric. Hopefully... Yeah we would move up in picks for three years in a row as well, right? Yeah. Seventh and then third, and then hopefully above that this year. Fingers crossed. We will see. But anyway, like Eric said, appreciate you guys for supporting us. We're out of here. Check out the links in the description on the way out of here and support the channel that way. That means a lot. And we're out of here until next time. As always, peace out. Go Blazers.